Okay, let's start our first talk by P. Monaco. I'm re-announcing it because some people just came from 3S and he will talk about generation of dark matter halo catalogs in the era of precision cosmology. Yeah. Hey, thank you. I will, uh, what I will, uh, well, uh, thank the organizer for uh, asking me to come here to talk about uh, this topic that uh, is uh, how approximate methods it became very popular in the age of precision cosmology, which is something counterintuitively in the ones you want to be percent accurate on your predictions. Now, the, well, uh, the, the starting point is that the CMB observations give us a very interesting um, snapshot of what happened to the Redshift 1100. Uh, and uh, uh, have allowed us to go to get into the era of precision cosmology with percent accurate parameters, but uh, they are leaving uh, the mystery of the dark setters open. We are um, we have a model that describes very well uh, with some tensions we have seen this morning uh, the, uh, what happens to larger scale structure, but. 70% uh, of it should be the of uh, the energy budget today should be made of something we don't understand, which is dark energy, and uh, matter should be mostly dark. Now, the dark energy dominates uh, at low redshift. So, if you want to make a precise uh, assessment of dark energy, you should measure the universe at lower redshift. And the measuring the universe at lower redshift has complications because you pass from an almost perfect black body with a very small uh, perturbations, linear perturbations, to a larger scale structure that is non linear and is traced by galaxies that, that are biased tracers. So uh, uh, the game is much more complicated and less clean. Fortunately, we have features like the baryonic oscillations measured, uh, uh, for instance, by the Boss collaboration or the growth rate of structure in this uh, slide taken fr uh, from the Planck papers that uh, can uh, give a very clean signals. Uh, the BAO is, uh, uh, as far as I understand, is a standard ruler, so it allows you to make the geometrical measurements, and the growth rate of structure depends directly on the theory of gravity. If the, if, uh, if the gravity is uh, by, given by GR, it should grow in a certain way. <coughs> So, uh, making these measurements, uh, we can uh, have uh, constraints on, uh, say, on the question of state of dark energy, and there are a number of uh, uh, present and future survey, like BOSS, DES, DAISY, uh, LSST, the SKA surveys uh, in the list, W first, and I'm participating to the preparation of the Euclid satellite, so I, I, I will mention it uh, several times in this talk. And, uh, well, the point is stolen this, uh, <coughs> this, uh, the, the, the idea of putting it this way from Will Percival. Now, suppose that we measure W0 minus uh, 95. If uh, this is minus 95 plus minus 0.1, this is not very interesting. But if it is uh, plus, minus, uh, plus minus 0.01, then this is interesting. So, uh, because uh, the um, reality is so... Uh, <coughs> So similar to the lambda CDM model, if you want to find some um, deviation from lambda CDM model, the error bar becomes the important thing. Now, this is complicated to, to communicate because typically the error bar is the boring part of the work. And so uh, co uh, the, talking about how the error bars are estimated may be a little boring, but I will try. I will uh, try this challenge. Now, the error budget is will be dominated by systematics because we will be measuring a fair uh, part of the visible universe the, uh, uh, up to redshift almost two. So we will be dominated by, by systematics. And uh, we, uh, in uh, the Euclid collaboration, we have put it this way. This is the posterior probability of having a parameter theta measured given the data D. And the base formula th th tells us that apart from the prior on uh, the theta parameter, the key quantity is the likelihood of the, the, of the data given the, the parameter's values. So, uh, systematics may come from the data, and this is the these are the obvious ones. The data systematics are all issues that concern the processing from raw data to measurements. I will not talk about this much. You, but you can have also, uh, also errors from theory, 
and from the, from the likelihood. Now, I will quickly comment these two points. Uh, making predictions of clustering at percent level in the nonlinear regime is complicated. Uh, yesterday already uh, Roman Scocimaro talked about uh, uh, analytic approaches to uh, larger scale structure and uh, the, um, the, 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 the existence of the bias of, gal of dark matter halos and then of galaxies that populate dark matter halos is complicated to deal with. And, uh, but even if you say, okay, we have simulations, let's use simulations, even simulations have hard times to predict clustering at k larger than one. This is a paper of a few years ago now, but shows the uh, power spectrum of matter from three different codes, PKD graph, uh, gadget and Ramses, and they do agree at percent level up to k1, and then they diverge. So, we don't really know what is the, the right answer here, so uh, numerical uh, accuracy is uh, not yet uh, um, achieved. Of course, people are working on it. Uh, Raul will, uh, will uh, talk about this issue later. And uh, the other thing is uh, likelihood. And to me, <coughs> if you have a Gaussian likelihood in the most simple uh, um, case, then this will depend on the data vector minus the expectation value, where the data vector may be, say, the two point correlation function in a number of beans or uh, the power spectrum in a number of k beans. And this must be multiplied by the uh, this precision matrix, which is the inverse of the covariance matrix, of, uh, that tells you how uh, uh, in the diagonal, which is the ex expected uncertainty on the, the, the data point, and uh, of diagonal how the points are correlated. Now, uh, the, the determination of this covariance matrix is uh, very complicated because this is a four-point function. And uh, typically it's done with mock catalogs, even though people are trying hard to make analytic predictions. But if you do it with mock catalogs, then you have a noise by the fact that you are, pop you are populating this uh, covariance matrix with a, with a not infinite number of mock catalogs. And uh, so the number of mock catalogs must be large because you propagate this noise through the inversion, so nonlinearly, to the uh, likelihood. Now, to, uh, <clears throat> to, make, to have control of this, you need thousands of huge simulations, not uh, uh, just a, a few. Now, how huge? S uh, suppose that you want to simulate a fair fraction of the observable universe. If you want to sample well the BAO, the baryonic acoustic oscillation, you need boxes larger than a gigaparsec. But if you want your, if you're not happy with replicating your box and you want your light cone, to be uh, con almost or fully contained in the, within one box, like on, uh, say, uh, up to redshift 2 for, uh, say, an octant of the sky, for a fraction of the sky, then you want to go to a world of 3, 4 gigaparsec boxes. And you want to resolve the halos that uh, host the smallest galaxies. The smallest galaxies are the most numerous, so are those that dominate the, sig the clustering signal. And uh, uh, they are hosted in the halos that typically are smaller than 10 to the 12 solar masses. This depends a lot on the definition of a sample, of the galaxy sample. But to be safe, you want to sample at least 10 to the 11 solar mass halos. And if you want apply uh, uses a halo substructure to better locate galaxies, or you want to apply semi-analytic models, you have to go down in mass even more. So the simulations go toward the uh, 16,000 cube particles. Such big simulations are being run now. Uh, uh, the year or oh, two years ago, a big simulation called the Euclid the flagship simulation was run for the Euclid collaboration by, especially by uh, Joachim Stadel in, uh, in at the Pittstein computer in uh, in uh, Zurich. And this uh, uh, was the largest simulation ever run. And uh, to 12,000 cube particles on a 3.78 um, gigaparsec over H box, the, uh, the particle mass uh, is uh, 2 times 10 to the 9. You want a halo to be sampled at least by 100 particles to fully believe it. So this is, we are almost there, but not yet. Now the, uh, they, are, they have, I think, already finished is, uh, this is a simulation for a wide survey, which is 16,000 cube, 
and they, are, they will start soon, or have already started, a simulation for the deep survey that has a smaller volume, a sample a smaller volume, but to, to much better resolution. This requires the, the most, most powerful computers and takes millions of hours. So uh, running one is a challenge, and it, uh, populate halos with galaxies is another challenge. Uh, running thousands is completely out of the question. So, uh, although we are looking for precision, uh, we are in the situation where uh, we have to resort to approximate methods to, have, uh, to generate uh, halo catalogs, which is something counterintuitively, if you want. Uh, I expect it, to be honest, that all the analytic approximations, including the Pinocchio tool that I will describe in a moment, uh, were completely gone out of the fashion with such big simulations run routinely. But this is not uh, what happened. And uh, so I found myself in playing again after years with things that have been done in the 90s when I was young, <laughs> like Zeldovich approximation, 2LPT, 3LPT, truncated Zeldovich approximation, plus more recent uh, development, uh, development like augmented 2LPT or muscle 2LPT. Now, uh, I, I've written a review on this subject a couple of years ago. Uh, I just mentioned there are two problems to solve to generate such a distribution of uh, halos. The first problem you want to solve is to move particles to the right place uh, from their Lagrange initial position to their final position, and then to collect particles into halos. The first problem is relatively easy. The second is more complicated. And, uh, a lot of methods have been proposed, and I've divided them broadly into two classes. The Lagrangian methods are trying to uh, uh, solve the problem, let's say, particle by particle. Uh, they, uh, they aim at understanding where the halos are really going to form. And uh, we have here a big patch that was mentioned by Dick Bond two days ago. This is uh, uh, yesterday, actually. That was uh, that is the first uh, uh, the, of these methods. Then Pinocchio, that I developed almost uh, 10, 20 years ago now, uh, and other methods. Especially, uh, the, uh, probably the most fashionable one is the particle mesh codes that are simulation co uh, codes, uh, and um, but uh, are used uh, to give a very quick answer, not just to be as uh, uh, accurate as possible. The pros is that they are predictive and that they need to be calibrated against simulations because you do not fully resolve halos, but you do it once in a cosmologically independent way. The, or you can, uh, well, the concept is that they have requirements, especially for memory, that are high. So you need a supercomputer, only that in the time needed by a simulation, run a thousand of them. Uh, Bias-based methods are based on another philosophy. You create a larger scale density fields and then you throw at random halos on the density peaks on, say, two megaparsec scales with some bias, um, uh, bias model so that the halos have the bias that you have decided. Um, and uh, the point, th they are very, very fast because you just need to, to produce a density field on two megaparsec scale. So you, you, in a workstation, you can run thousands uh, in, a, in a weekend. Uh, the cons is that their calibration is complicated, and anyway, you have to calibrate them each time you change cosmology or each time you change galaxy sample. And uh, you need a big simulation to calibrate against. <coughs> Uh, my method, pinpointing Norby crossing collapse hierarchical objects, has, develop, has been developed in this paper, starting from 2002 with the Tom Turns and uh, uh, Giuliano Taffoni. And then we uh, took it again and uh, with Emiliano Sefusati, Stefano Borgani, uh, and the people, and especially Emiliano Munari, that helped me a lot uh, in the, for the latest release. If you ask why I call the code as a, uh, with the name of the most famous cheater, well, he is cheating. He pretends to be an body simulation, but he's way too fast to be one. Okay, this is the joke. Uh, it is available on my webpage also on, uh, on GitHub. Uh, I will not go through the code, just to mention the foundations that are ellipsoidal collapse applied to the mass element, Lagrangian perturbation theory to compute collapse times of uh, uh, ellipsoidal collapse. These two points were mentioned yesterday by Charvari <coughs> in her talk. 
and uh, excursion set theory uh, to deal with the fact that you do a prediction on a smoother density field. So you have to understand what to do with the, uh, the smoothing radius. Thank you. <coughs> and once you know when particles have collapsed, you collect them into halos with a, an algori algorithm that mimics hierarchical clustering. Now, uh, how does it work? This is the prediction for the power spectrum. And uh, here I'm collecting two information uh, separately. What, uh, on the upper panel, you see how Pinocchio is able to predict the normalization, so the bias of uh, the power spectrum of dark matter halos. Here in redshift space for redshift 0 and 1, for, with a cut of 100 particles and 500 particles, compared to a simulation run on the same seats, and for various flavors. Of course, then we have chosen the best performing one. And uh, uh, so uh, you can see that uh, you have uh, uh, some un uncertainty on the bias parameter, that is a few percent, but then you can uh, predict, in the worst case, uh, the, uh, the power spectrum with good accuracy up to k.2.3, and uh, in some cases up to k even 0.4. So we are going to the uh, mildly nonlinear regime pretty well. Bias uh, is a prediction with, the, for instance, with Asim, we did the, this paper a few years ago, comparing an earlier version of Pinocchio uh, with his uh, model for halo bias, and uh, Pinocchio and the Nenembadi simulations were used on the same footing, and they were giving a uh, pretty good result. <clears throat> so, we are predicting bias. This means that, being it an approximate method, we have a few percent error on the bias. This must be taken into account. Now, uh, before I go on, let me, s let me mention, when you want to compute clustering, you have two regimes broadly. The two halo term, say, on scales of larger than three megaparsec, a ratio zero, where you are dominated by the correlation function of halos. This is where uh, codes like Pinocchio or n body simulations work well. But uh, when you go to smaller scales, you are in, inside the halos. You have the one halo term that is dominated by how galaxies populate the halos. There are several methods to populate the halos. I will mention now the, the HOD method. I'm, I'm going fast here. The point is that you are not predictive in this range. That's because how galaxies populate halos is determined by galaxy formation and by a number of baryonic effects. So the predictivity is on larger scales. So if we want to understand why if a method is accurate enough, you want to get well the two halo term. If you are wrong uh, at scales that are anyway dominated by the two one halo term, this is not a big issue at this level. So the, just to understand what, uh, how, what is the passage from uh, dark matter halos to galaxies, this is a full sky light cone generated by Pinocchio. This is a stripe across the sky, 360 degrees. The hole at the center is due to the fact that uh, you have a little volume when you are, uh, um, you are near. And uh, this is the larger scale structure. Uh, one dot is one halo. Uh, this is if you populate uh, the dots with uh, galaxies, blue and red galaxies, with an HOD. And uh, this is when you go to Reshi space where you start seeing the fingers of God. <clears throat> now, uh, just very quickly, I'm, uh, I'm developing Pinocchio further. I'm uh, trying to do the prediction for, gal for galaxy lensings. Uh, also, I'm trying to go beyond Lambda CDM. First, we introduced neutrinos. The trick, I have to say, but the trick was working nice well. I can, uh, if you want, I can tell you more in the questions. And then we are struggling to find the formulation for uh, uh, F of R gravity. Now, how accurate these, the, do these methods need to be? Uh, the point is, that if you want the average power spectrum uh, for a galaxy, you, you use either analytic methods, of course, or simulations. Uh, you, you want to use these methods to have covariances where you need thousands of, re of realizations. And small scales are dominated by one halo term. So you need to be accurate on larger scales and uh, on the variance more than on the average. So how do you quantify it? Thanks. We uh, quantify it this way. We want error bars on cosmological parameters to be accurate within 10%. So we went through, uh, <coughs> we, uh, within the Euclid collaboration, we took several methods, uh, Pino I call up Pinocchio, Pic Patch, Allogen Patch, and the log normal method. And we uh, tried to uh, see how we can predict 
uh, the cosmological parameters using the approximate methods to sample the covariance matrix. And uh, the results with respect to uh, a set of simulations run on the same seed. This is uh, how the two-point correlation function comes out as the average. So as for the average, the methods are working pretty well. Uh, this is for the power spectrum. Is a way of three papers, so I've been taking one plot per paper. How the error on the error bar uh, for three cosmological parameters, three biased nuisance parameters. Most methods, with some exceptions, lie to within 5%. This means that they are pretty acceptable. Uh, the B spectrum turned out to be more selective, where some methods are able to predict uh, the, the, the value of the B spectrum in its variance, while other methods have uh, more problems, especially the g g naive Gaussian um, expectation value it, uh, doesn't give a good result. So, uh, uh, finishes, I've produced this message for who, who is interested. I've, used, I've produced tens of thousands of mock catalogs for Euclid and for my uh, scope. This is a little table of what I have. And so, if you're interested in this kind of applications, uh, we can talk. It is a public code. You can download, you run your own catalog or ask me for the files. And this is the last slide, it's just a summary, uh, so I can leave it uh, to, for you to read. Just a, a think when we compared uh, predictive uh, methods like Pinocchio or Color Pick Patch with the calibrated methods, I expected that the calibrated methods would work better because they are calibrated to reproduce what they were trying to. Actually, the, the, the result was the other way around, so in this case, the predictivity of the model has paid. <clears throat> We can take two, two, three questions. What's the, oh, sorry. What's the biggest problem to move to F of R models? Lagrangian perturbation theory for uh, modified gravity is, must be reformulated. And the, uh, Pinocchio is based on Lagrangian perturbation theory to a great extent. And so uh, the reformulation uh, means that in normal uh, LPT you uh, have a complicated equation that, that can be factorized order by order into a space part and, and into a time part. In F, in, uh, we have tried F of R. In F of R it is not possible. So one point is to make a, 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 an effective factorization. The other point is to understand how good this effective uh, um, division is. And the, I don't say anything because it's uh, something that we are doing just now, so I'm not completely sure of the results. I want to, to cross-check them, but uh, it is not obvious that uh, you, can, uh, you can formulate 2LPT and 3LPT effectively in, in, in the modified gravity. Okay, any more? Yeah. Sounds like a neutrino trick. <laughs> no, this, uh, there were a set of simulations uh, done by uh, the group of Matteo Viel, so by Paco Villescuse, Emanuele Castorina, Matteo Costanzi. They saw that you can uh, analytically predict the Alamas function by assuming that the neutrinos are linear, and so instead of plugging in the um, the uh, total power spec, matter power spectrum, you uh, uh, plug in the dark matter plus baryons power spectrum. Uh, and then the point is that at this point the growth rate is scale dependent. So I have changed the code to uh, take into account the scale dependence of the growth rate and, uh, uh, and the results were pretty, pretty nice. So this is the trick. The, the, unfortunately, the trick cannot be applied to uh, modified gravity because the scale dependence is not just uh, another relativistic component that, that is changing the power spectrum, but this, uh, it relates on how uh, the structure grows. And so that the same trick is not useful for uh, FOVAR. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.